How are you guys doing? Pretty good. So, thanks for coming. I'm Matt Owens. I run a design firm called Athletics. And uh, this is Sam Rose. He's one of my colleagues. And the reason I brought Sam here is because, sort of like, I would say, like, you guys are at this first start of your career. And then I would say Sam's sort of like in the middle. And then I would say, like, I'm kind of on the end. Like, I'm, I would say I'm a mid career designer. Um, and so, like, what we're going to do today is talk about, you know, business and sort of self-employment and running your own company and working for, you know, big companies and what that really means. Um, just as kind of an advance note, a lot of, the two are hand-in-hand. In a lot of ways, you know, we'll kind of cover how working with big companies is actually not going to be that different from what you need to do when running your own company just anyway, if you're going to do so successfully. So, right. So, <laughs> athletics is 10 of us. Been doing it since 04. Before that, worked for a company, for, you know, went to school, graduated, worked for a company for a long time, and then started my own company uh, that was more web oriented, and sold that, and then started athletics. Yeah. It's very multidisciplinary. So, this is a group of us some you know, designers, developers, motion, brand, all under one roof. So, that's the kind of interesting thing about us. Like, we do a lot of different things. So, if you want to do iOS development, if you want to do you know, web development, if you want to do brand development, motion graphics, we kind of have yeah. enough people under one umbrella. Yeah. Now, Sam, why don't you talk sort of about the, the sort of political structure? The political structure, I guess, uh, such as it is, is that uh, everybody kind of has their own separate studio. Uh, uh, so everybody will bring in their own work, do their own work. Uh, but then on top of that, we all will kind of pool together flexibly, uh, kind of uh, when larger projects come in. So I might, you know, in a week do I don't know, four or five magazine illustrations, but also be working on, you know, as well, like a larger project with, you know, say, Matt and you know, one or two other people. So it's, it's really flexible. Like, who you're working with at any given time can really vary. What you're working on can really vary. So it's nice, you know, never get stale, but that's kind of the thing is you're, you have the freedom to kind of do what you want, but also you can work with people on things that maybe would be too large for one person. Right. And so, like, we do a, this is just sort of a, you know, a range of things. Like, we might be doing information graphics, typography, motion graphics, data visualization, websites, it kind of runs through the games. And so one thing I want to talk about is like the sort of business model. And so for a normal, I don't know, how many people here have like, or have had like normal jobs in big companies? Right, so you know like, big companies, a lot of moving parts. And so when I talk, to, when I talk about a big company, it's like this multi-project team model where like you might be part of a team and part of a project, but there might be some other people in some other office that you don't even know that's doing something else that might be complimentary or they might have knowledge that would help you. But with the way that organism, the mechanism is set up, is like you can't get that knowledge, right? Because it's too big. And so, you know, a lot of companies like this, and the thing that you guys need to understand when you go out there in the workforce is like, most big companies, it's, it's not about you. It's about the, the nervous system. The company organization and the nervous system is way more important than the project and the person. Projects come and go, people come and go. The organism is most important. And so that's just the nature of business, the nature of big companies. Hold on one more thing before you go ahead and step forward. It's like, uh, and this is a pretty crucial thing that doesn't always occur to you when you first you know, kind of set out on your own. <clears throat> but you know, if this is you and you're part of one of these things, you know, this person over here is facing the client and they have a full-time job that consists of just doing that. But if you're here and say you're a designer, or say you're you know, whatever, and you're working for yourself, you have to do that plus that person's full-time job plus this accountant's full-time job plus you know whatever. Right. So that's something to keep in mind. There's in a big company there's this big structure and they're kind of uh, sort of very compartmentalized. Right. And so like you might have like everybody from a designer to a minister of technology or a ideation and con concepting person or somebody that's just doing quality assurance app analysis. You know, it's like it's all these sort of weird titles that are very compartmentalized. In our studio, it's very product driven. So it's like it's not about the, the, it's not about the organism, it's about the project. And so on the client side and on the studio side, it's like, what does the project need? What are the team for that project? And that's it. Like, it's not about like, oh, I need to have X number of projects and X number of bodies to produce X number of dollars to produce X number of billables. Like, it's not really about that. It's about like doing work and focusing on the task at hand. And that's yeah. just kind of just a different thing. Well, we're not trying to find something for people to do. We're trying to find people to do the thing that needs to get done. Right. 
So we, you know, with that said, we've done tons of work with big brands. You know, it's sort of a glimpse at kind of the people we've worked for in the past, and you know, like I've been doing this for a long time. You know, and and, and it, this model works for us, and big brands understand it and are comfortable with it. So it's not like we're doing something that's totally. We're not doing this in our attic or in our basement or in a garage. Like we're a real studio, but we just choose to do it in a different way. Um, a case study is a good example. Is 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 Forbes, and Forbes is really. We rebranded Forbes and Print Online. It's a long project, two year long project, a lot of money, a lot of pain, a lot of politics. Uh, but overarching professionalism is the key. And I would have you guys understand that like, when you do something and you work for a client or you work for yourself or you start your own business, like, your job is to be more professional than the professionals you work with. Like, you have to be more articulate, smarter, more on time, more bullet bulletproof. Because you're doing it all, and you're commanding it all, and you're responsible for all, all of it. When you're doing, when you're a cog in a machine, you just have to know what that your job is, and then you can go to lunch for an hour, come back, and put your headphones on, and do that ad infinitum. Like when you run your own business, it's a lot more moving parts, a lot more responsibility. So professionalism is central. So for example, for Forbes, like this is for the 400th day on September. You know, we redesigned all the sort of cover formats, typography. We've been doing all the covers and art directing them every two weeks for the last two years. Uh, so that, you know, idea comes in from editors. We get, you know, work with a photographer, get the image, find the image, select it, composite it, get it out the door, and try to keep them all part of a universe, but quite buried. Um, you know, doing information graphics, trying to, you know, working with editors to figure out all this crazy stuff and, and figure out what, what those things are, um, and then you know, developing information graphics around those larger editorial concepts. Uh, coming up with editorial systems. So this is basically. Um, ways of combining statistics and other information into a captivating sort of format that they can do every week. So this sort of these you know sort of world trade by the numbers and then these sort of wealth watch breakdowns. These are things that we work with editors and try to figure out what made most sense for them. Can we work formats accordingly? Information uh, you know illustration an illustration system so that when you go and open up Forbes if you see illustrations they are all consistent. And then editorial frameworks that are more sort of cut and dry. And then, you know, the other big thing that is way more costly and way more time consuming is all the web development and mobile development on our side. So there's three full-time people. All they do is work on Forbes. They are going, doing everything from, come on in. I'll slow down. I can start over. <laughs> but, you know, the idea is that, like, for something like this, that's the, the, on the development side, is so ambitious. You have to understand that like one person is leading this and is basically on never any conference calls, and then all that information trickles down to two other people, two development, a front end, and, and front, two front end developers, sort of one developing design. And really, all of this work is basically, if you go behind the scenes, there's this giant company that has a lot of moving parts and a lot of politics, and all that stuff is digested through our company, and and our job is to clean it up and clarify, so that. If they, had, they could never do it themselves because they're too large and unwieldy and there's too much politics and too much division. So what they've done is they sort of like vomit out all the desires and needs to us and then as a crack team that's small, kind of catalogs that and works with our own team to look sort of like clearly define those needs and actually go all the way to getting them sort of functional code. And so it's, the, the, for us it's awesome because they give us a lot of control and a lot of power because if they were left with their own devices, they would just fight amongst themselves, you know, so it's a good example. Kind of an additional point, though, is, uh, you know, big companies typically are used to working with other big companies, so they expect uh, pretty frequently, you know, who they're working with to be able to just throw a bunch of people at and just, like, pound it out quickly. So, you know, we are a small team doing all this stuff, and we have to be able to do it. I mean, we have to work harder and faster and better than, yes. like, a some, you know, a small call at a big company. Like so, James, who wears our office, he's like, the best thing he you know, he's like, I just got off a conference call, and it's like the most amazing, it's, it's amazing when you work inside of a big company, people on the call are blatantly saying something that is untrue. They're like, well, you know, hey, Jonathan, you know, you're working on that little part of the, uh, probably want to see where that status is, get a status update, and Jonathan's like, it's, you know, it's basically done, you know, we pretty much cut and dry, like, we're just waiting for X, Y, and Z. And basically, Jonathan has not done his job, because he doesn't need to do his job, because there's this other person that has to do this other part of the job that really informs his part of the job, and that guy hasn't finished his part of the job anyway, so, like, there's this sort of, like, 
weird tag team of inefficiency. Right. And sort of like, like I've worked in that environment. That sucks. It's like you can't get those days and those moments back in your life. So I'd rather work with something that's more clear and more exact. So working and trying to deal, you know, battle through that politics is something you do on a daily basis. And that comes to the art of business, which is this is the little aside. Is that I think for young people, the thing you don't learn in school and the thing that you have to learn when you're self-employed is that. It's not about the pro. It's, it's 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 as much about the product. It's as much about the finish, the, the website, the brand, the logo, whatever you're trying to do. It's like it's as much about that as it is about the art of business. And it's the dance. It's like people when you come out of school, you're like, I want to make cool stuff. Like that's where your head's at. Well, like to make cool things, you have to understand that, that there's this process that you develop to get from A to Z, and that is the process is what clients pay for. The dance, the art of business, right? It's like, I, I, in, in simpler terms, it's like, it's the difference between designing graphics and graphic design. It's like designing graphics is like, look at this logo I did for this band. Like, graphic design is a discipline. It says, if we're going to develop a brand identity for you, we're going to go through this process. Here are the phases. We're going to go through discovery. We're going to come up with different models of who you are as a business and why, and understand what those things are. And then from that, we're going to come up with sort of a plan of attack to capture those ideas in material form, and then we're going to iterate upon them, and then through all this crazy stuff, you're going to get the logo that that is informed by all this thinking. That's the art of business. And then on top of that, there's writing proposals, there's writing emails, going to meetings, being on phone calls. Uh, you know, you'll I think pretty frequently find that whatever the creative endeavor is that you're actually like belaboring, you know, what, what you do, whether it's music or you know, design or whatever. Uh, you spend a lot of times maybe 40% doing that and then 60% doing these other things that you have to be equally proficient at. Uh, right, and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's the um factor. It's like we have a junior designer who I love, who's great, who's a great production person, but like he's hard at meetings because he's, he's sort of, the, it's like the little bro in your meeting. It's like, he's like, um, um, uh, and it's like, well, it's like, you gotta be an adult. Like, you have to be grown up. You have to be participant. You have to be clear. And if you can't do that, don't say anything and write a lot of notes. You know, and it's like, I feel like that art of business, that sort of the articulateness, like the fact that I can look you in the eye and make you believe that, that you need to give me money to do some stuff is a certain kind of art form to it. And that if you want to be a good designer, in lockstep, you need to be as good at talking about your work and defending it and understanding and convincing people that you justify the dollars that you're trying to charge. So that is the art of business. I think that's something that we, I didn't learn in school, and I learned just through the battle of being self-employed. A lot of it comes from just doing it and you know being around other people. You know, uh, for me, uh, you know, I've only been doing what I do for I don't know what two years, yeah. maybe. So you know, being around Matt and the other you know gents and ladies of athletics is is great because I can pick that up. But I also before I even got started, before I even met them, you know, I kind of started down that road of trying to put it together for myself, and that's. You know, something that at this time period, that's something that nobody tells you to really do. Uh, finances and kind of like business acumen, but be thinking about it. You know? yeah. uh, you're, you're, when you're self-employed or when you're at a small company, you are always on. Like your business never stops. Not that you're, you know, actually like working every second, but uh, but it. You got to live it. You know, you got to be always. Uh, Get into it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, it's, it's great because once you're able to kind of give yourself over to that, it becomes so much easier and the work gets better, the business gets easier. But, uh, you know, there's kind of no half measures when you work for yourself. So totally. that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. And so, you know, the second part of that is, is, is the value of skill. When, uh, you know, if you're a 24 year old person and you come to me and say, hey, I really love design, I want to be, get a job, you know, I really love to work in a small firm like yours, what can I do to do that? I'm like, oh, there's only three words you need to understand. Chops, chops, chops. It's like, this is not learn on the job. This is like, I'm excited about design and I am so excited to have it taken it upon myself to learn X, Y, and Z and I'm curious about this and I crack this program and learn this and fumble my way through this and I have this to show. It's not like, you know, it's like, yeah, everyone wants to learn guitar and be in a band but no one wants to go through pain and suffering and a veteran to do so. And I'm in a small company where like, if you don't have a certain degree of skill set out of the gate, I can't help you, you know? And so to that end, Something like Stuber Street Fighter, which is like the opposite end of Forbes, where worked with another agency in Capcom. Capcom's in Japan. They read in Super Street Fighter 4 last year, got just blades to do the music, and they were like, oh, we did these print ads that are kind of graffiti street art, but 
we can't get one guy to do it because they don't have the skills. Like, can you guys help us? And we're like, sure. So two of us basically went through and boarded out all the scenes using green screen footage from the, the from motion capture from the 3D. Had to go through and break down every character in in the thing. Go so from like you know Chun Li to Dudley to Cody. Come up with little logo brands for all of them, and then composite all that into storyboards, and then actually like edit and animate all that stuff together. So what we're talking about here is skill set. It's like. David and I had to generate all the identities. Well, you know what? David has a weird, goofy design style that isn't appropriate. So I had to look, I had to kind of, not that it was inappropriate, but it, was like it became something specific. So I had to have him sort of say, you have to channel this vibe. So I might have done the Vega uh, logo, but then Dave might have done the Seth logo, or he might have done the, you know, the boom, and then I did the new for combos, but you're not supposed to know that. You're supposed to say that we've worked as a team and we have a skill set that allows that to come together as a cohesive voice. Like, if you take any two of these together, they might be disparate, but they think the answer is in, in the program, or students think the answer is, like, by building a website, or the, the answer is by, like, having a bunch of, like, Twitter followers. It's like, that's, like, the consequence, not the subject. And so for you guys, you need to focus about like, it's like if you have the work, if you have the skill, and you can talk articulately about what you're doing, you will get all of those other things. That, it's like, if you don't have the substance, you don't have the pizza, you can't have the restaurant. And everyone wants to talk about the pizza, the, the restaurant, you know what I mean? And so for us, it's like when I started and I got out of school, I basically was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna make a bunch of cool stuff that I like and put it on the internet and like try really hard to do it every, you know, four times a year. So I ended up doing, these seasons, these are like really, really old. You know, published seasons that did 30 of them for a year, regularly, weird crap hot ideas, all of them had like little moving parts and stuff, animation. But what was awesome about it is like it became a thing people could look forward to. And I just got a following of people out there in the world that were fans of it. Oh, that's cool, I like that. And then people ended up like, you know, getting into the work and I got client projects after. From it. It's like, for example, doing more custom type work. Um, these are just postcards that I did for fun, but then, you know, I did a motion piece for it. And then eventually, like, after doing some, I got, like, oh, Vanity Fair called me. It's like, oh, that stuff you did. Like, could you do something for us? Sure. You know, it's like, could you do 100, you know, all the, all the numbers? No problem. Um, you know, oh, you can play UK. Can you use that cool custom type idea and do something for us? Sure. Um, same. It's like, oh, I want to do this, like, more kind of juicier, clunkier, kind of top, top, type stuff that I feel is very simple. And then did a couple of these, and then got to do some stuff for ESPN, where they're like, oh, do you want to do this table of contents page? I'm like, totally, that would be awesome. So it's like, again, it's like the work first, your passion first, and then that results in these other things. You know, it's like my buddy Kimo is working in New York. He's like, oh, I love your brother, my twin brother and I. It's like, it's like, I would love for you guys to do skateboards. I know you've like, or done skateboarding and been into it. And they had, we had us do the Urbane Jungle series for New York. So it was all New York themed. So we had literature, the um, architecture, food, the arts, um, and transit, uh, and the souvenir. So got to do these, became skateboards, t-shirts, tons of different stuff. And then, you know, it's like rolling me you know, at Christmas time with my mom going to Target. And then you see like, Oh, dude, there's my stuff in Target, a little mini skateboards. It's like, the stuff is, it's like your idea and it becomes real and goes out there in the world and becomes something really cool. And like, that's the whole reason to do this. Like, it's not to go into a job and like clock in and clock out. It's to have a cultural product that goes out there in the world and it does work that it, outside of you. It's like, that's totally the most rewarding aspect, you know? So this is like, kind of, I guess, kind of a counterpoint. Same deal, it's not counterpoints, the same point, but for me, like, uh, before I, uh, Started freelancing. I uh, worked a retail job. I was sitting at the computer, and uh, I had, you know, just I, I did not go to design school. Uh, I just all self-taught. So actually, at work, I was working on learning Illustrator, and uh, you know, this is something that really was not like. Uh, I just kind of had the idea and kind of cranked it out in like I don't know, half an hour while I was thinking about other things, uh, and then I posted it on Flickr or something. And you know, this was a couple of years ago. To this day. Anytime, almost, I get some kind of a, an email from some a new client wanting illustration, they reference that. They're like, "Oh, I saw this thing and really liked it." And it's like, you know, that's the kind of thing. Like, 
when I say like you have to always be on, part of that is always like doing the work that you want to do in your spare time because it can lead to other things. So like all of these are examples of things where somebody saw that or you know a couple of other things that are similar and were like, hey, we like this, like we want you to do X or Y thing. So you know it's it's always the work that you do for yourself becomes work that you do for big brands. It's putting yeah, putting your best foot forward. Yeah, and there's another thing where uh, I just did some sketch about kind of. Uh, uh, like a kind of a silhouette uh, character doing uh, kind of with some like accoutrements on top of it and then that became this theme that uh, I guess for about a year for uh, Southwest Airlines every month um, actually it was over a year, I think it was 14 months uh, it was another thing, you know, the, the brief, the prompt rather varied but um, this is another thing, it was just something I did for fun that, uh, you know, bore fruit Yeah, totally You know, like we do our own stuff too to try and get it out there we do our own kind of graphic licensing called actualobjects.com where we like, oh, this would be a cool theme, let's develop it and put it online, and people can use it. So it's like layered Illustrator files that are toolkit that like we use ourselves and is out there that can be bought and done royalty free, whether it's mascots or politics or holiday or whatever, you know. It's like creating these sort of themes that can be used and people download them and like one of the big you know, like all these blanks for different like mobile devices that like, we use them for. Like we grab them and I like, can use them to pitch for pitches and it's very useful. And then one of the big things we just did was the developer's friend, which is 400, 400 icon glyph set for mobile for mobile devices, so for retina display and regular iPhone. And like you can actually go to our blog and if you get the Easter egg, you can get these for free. But it's like it's blockbuster because like I cannot like we put it up and my buddy who was like a super, you know, web Viper guy that has like a half a million Twitter followers, like he mentioned it, and like just never ending purchases was awesome, you know, and it's like it's giving back that usefulness, like what's going to be useful to me, I'm going to make it, I'm going to get it out there, and it's going to, this feedback loop, you know, and it's really that network and that feedback loop that's important. You know, these are just, you know, you can go to these URLs, so Athletics MIT, Volume 1, Sam Rose, Actual Object, and see more of our stuff, and you know, now we just want to sort of, that's kind of like us in a nutshell. And now I don't want to take questions because you know I think we're here to go to three thirty. So you know, you know I'm I'm fortunate. Like I feel very very lucky. It's like I went to undergraduate in Texas, went to graduate school, got out, worked for a couple years, like went on my own, started a company, ran it, got burned out, quit that, started another company, started athletics seven years ago, and now I'm here today and I have everything a normal normal person has: wife, kid, house. Somehow, miraculously, I've been able to survive it all. And come to you on a Saturday and say, like, yo, I can do it, you can certainly do it, and we're here to sort of take those questions and, 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 and you know, share with you our insights. So. Anybody? Yeah? What has been your favorite project that you've worked on? Ever? I mean, I don't have a favorite project, per se. I mean, I feel like, like, we did these spots for Sundance Channel that are these little short films. It was really cool because, like, they're sort of timeless and have a lot of legs. Like, I cannot tell you how much stuff I've done online that never that you will never see again because like the economy of the web is so omnivorous. Like, oh, this is awesome! I did this in 1999. Well, guess what? The web in '99 compared to the web now is like so different. And so the things that I like the most are the things that I can keep and and show people and like have a body of work that I can like share and stand behind. The things that are the hard, the things I like the least, I might like them when I'm doing them, but the things that are sort of go away or like, oh, I developed this really crazy website. Well, okay, that whole technology is irrelevant now. Like, now I can't show it. Like, those are the ones that I don't, the ones that don't have cultural legs are the ones that I don't like. You know? So, yeah. What was something that you had to learn along the way that, you know, when you see these people that are starting, they're 23, 24, you wish that you could teach it to them, but, you know, it's something that... Well, like, let's say if I started a university, mm -hmm. which you could, could all attend and you guys would be amazing to your program. Very expensive. Uh, like what I would do is business, business, business. It's like I would have a whole thing that would be a full semester of like this is how you run a meeting. Mm -hmm. This is how you manage a project. This is how you write a proposal. This is how you justify dollar figures. Like because that's the thing you never learn in, in school. You don't learn that like you learn that you want to like that. Like you learn like Stefan Zagmeister is cool and magically makes money at design, and that's about all you learn. Like, and like, which is complete bullshit. It's like there's all this other crap behind that's like really hard to do and like super grown up and super difficult and challenging. And like, those are the things I would that, that I had to learn. You know, it's just like you want to learn 
kind of really the reality yeah. of business. I mean, I, I, uh, I have a college degree that's in philosophy, not design. Like, it really has very little impact on what I do day to day. Uh, but let's say your intelligence is benefiting you a great deal. Sure. Oh, well, I mean, let's hope so. It's nice to say that. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I, uh, you know, for me, really everything I've had to learn, and you know, the things that I thought I knew, I'm constantly realizing, like, oh yeah, you know, perfect example. Uh, you know, all the Adobe programs are just like filled with arcane details. And it's like, I'll do something, you know, some way that I figured out and constantly, you know, somebody else will watch what I'm doing and be like, oh, you should do this, it's way faster. Like, command, shift, D. And I'm like, what? So it's like, you know, it's, there's little things that you're always learning away and then there's, you know, big things too, of course. You know, business is really important, finance is, that's a But to your point, also, it's like, you can't do it all. Like, everyone thinks they're in their little room trying to do it all. It's like, the, it's like football. It's like the better your team, better your players, the better you're going to score. You know what I mean? That's kind of how we work. Really. Yeah, be as good as you can be, but also know what you're best at and what you're not as good at, and how to link up with those people that are better at where you're lacking. Right. Like if somebody wants to give me a bunch of money to build a website and it's something that I can't physically do, like I will certainly find that team and build a team that is exemplary that can do it because I can manage it and I can design it and make sure it's awesome. But like, can I get in there and like, Rig in some sort of like you know weird technical crazy jQuery stuff maybe but like I would rather pay somebody that's really good at that to do it. Yeah. So, you had a question? Yeah. So now that you've made a business of what you're passionate about, have you found that you need a different outlet since your business is now that art? Is there something that you found? Sort of. Sort of. I mean, like that's the art still goes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, last summer we kind of all, uh, everybody in the studio, not everybody, but several people in the studio kind of like uh, did a, a project together and we kind of just like peer reviewed each other. Um, so that was, you know, that was kind of the thing that where you were like, oh, I've had this idea floating around, but I haven't had time to do anything with it or I haven't had like a, a vehicle for it. And we kind of said like, let's just make some projects and make some projects. Right. Um, and so like to, to the outlet comment, I kind of subscribe to a different method, which is like, I subscribe to more of the sort of perfect apps method, which is like, you got to do a little bit every day, right? It's like, you could just work out on Saturdays, but like, okay, I, eat a bit, I just ate a giant pizza on Sunday, so whatever. So it's like, I, I try to like keep the creative fire like going a little bit every day. So I'll carve out a little bit of time, like, you know, after my, you know, 19 month old child gives me the business and actually goes to sleep, I'll like, work on something or I'll do it in the morning or I'll do it in the middle of the day. I'll be like, before I start my job job stuff, I'm gonna really attack this. And so I try to build it into the, like the daily program because if you, if, if you treat your passions like a hobby, they will always remain so. So you have to treat them like a job. It's kind of weird to say, but like the things you love, you have to kind of be serious about. Or they will always remain this sort of vestigial element in your life. So for me, I'm very passionate about what I do. I'm very fortunate. Like I wake up every day totally feeling like the luckiest human being in the world. But like, I wake up every day going, I feel like I've already lived two lifetimes and have worked more than most people that I know. You know, so that's the only trade-off. It's like I get to do whatever I want, but the consequences are much higher. I was going to ask, um, what were some financing options that you used to start up your business? Like, how did you grow it? Where did you get it? I lived in a really terrible, gross apartment for a long time and saved a bunch of money. Uh, I started my first company with $10,000, which I saved up between the ages of 24 and 28. I lived with Eric Goyt. He was a totally amazing human being, but basically ate, like, gross Chinese food every day. And so I just saved, 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 and worked. And then I got to a point where I was like, all right, this isn't a lot of money, this is enough to like start something. Or it's enough money for me to stop doing the stuff I have to do every day to think about this other thing. So it was a real, it was just kind of, you know, like my parents were teachers, like I didn't have money, like I just lived for cheap and saved, you know, and like that, that $10,000 went by really quick, but I, I got a business partner, we like hustled up some work, we, we were fortunate, we just like kind of scrapped it together, you know, and like, there's feast and famine still, you know, the world's changed a lot. Like I've, I've, uh, I've coasted on a lot of different tr design trends and technological trends and, you know, you can milk that for so long and then those change and so it's like, it's that ebb and flow. But to start it, it's just to start it. It's like, it doesn't matter if it's a band or a business, it's like, begin at the beginning. 
you know, yeah, we'll we'll go go a long we're, you know, we're kind of in this, uh, this Kickstarter kind of paradigm, the, the rage right now, and it's this thing like, you got to put it together, and you've got to like define a starting point, and at that starting point you have X amount of dollars. But like, I think, you know, Matt, like the era where he got started, I'm coming out of punk rock and that whole scene, and then, you know, uh, for myself, just, I mean, I guess I just barely missed the beginning of Kickstarter, or, you know, things like this, crowd crowdsourcing or funding or whatever. So like, I just worked in my free time while I had other jobs until suddenly I had enough clients that I could just kick the job. Yeah. So I mean, it's like, uh, starting a business, like, I mean, obviously it depends on the scale of the business you want to start, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's like, the business is started. It's something that can kind of, you know, pick up its own steam over I mean, time. and I would say like one, one thing I did was, I was already out there and already had a job, had a bunch of responsibility, was managing people. Like I was 20, when I, when I left, I was 27. And I was like, I can do this. I'm not afraid of it. I understand like how it works. And like, I quit my job and I had one client and I just like, you know, but it was also a perfect, it was a different era. It's like perfect storm, you know, it's like I was right place, right time. So some of it you can control and some of it you can. And like, I, you know, I did that for a while and then quit that and did this other thing and left that and now I'm doing this, this thing and like that's changing. So it's never the same. And I think that's what I was talking to my buddy Anthony. I don't know if you guys know the pizza place out in Bushwick, Roberta's. But he was like, we're, okay, he was like, was, he was the first big chef there. And like, he's like 30. And like, he has this crazy past where he worked in the web world and like gave that up and started cooking. And, and he's like, he's like, the reason I like, and, and Chris, who owns Roberta's, is a friend of mine. And he's like, he's like, the reason I like working in, in that environment is that it's kind of chaotic. Like, it's also like, it can kind of change and be whatever you want it to be. And like, if you're not into that, like, you have to be wired for that as a person. Like, I can't, you know, it's like, I put up, like, ridiculous punk rock records in the 90s that, like, you know, several hundred people own. You know, but it's like, I still get emails, it's like, dude, I want that record. And it's like, that's awesome. Like, I love that, you know, and it's like, I love having done that. I ran a gallery for eight years in Williamsburg and, like, probably gave everyone in Williamsburg three free beers over the course of eight years. <laughs> But like we had awesome shows and like people come to me and, and like oh man I love the Riviera that was an awesome gallery I love your show. you know it's like it's cultural product it's like it's the impetus to do it and to try and to succeed or fail and knowing that that's exciting you know and, and, and for me that's that's the heart of what business is you know. Well, let me ask, as a when you started you were a small company how did you get the larger companies or the larger connections to take on this? Especially as a creative, as a creative right. business. Like, Trent, I think the reason we got bigger, the reason we got bigger clients is we really tried to like craft like a larger cultural perception. So even if we were two people, we tried to look like five. I think we still do that now. We're liars. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> thievery, smoking mirrors. Yeah, that's why it's totally true. Like ninety-nine percent of everything done in the creative field is smoking mirrors. Like. Ad agencies just basically hire really amazing people externally and then charge the client a lot of money. It's like, two people should look like five, five should look like 10, 10 should look like 20. That's how you get bigger projects. And being able to uh, pr that pr project that perception, so going into meeting with a little body count at the beginning, like make sure that they understand what you're doing. And then also like delivering upon the promise. So it's two things, it's like, believe that you can do it, do it, Believe you can do it, do it with fewer people, make them perceive that you're more, and then succeed at it, and then build upon that again. Okay. So that's how I've always done it. One more note on that real quick, and I'll take another, but like, kind of on a more tangible level, perhaps. Like, uh, I think it's about doing really good work, and if you are super professional, the you know, like, big companies, the kind of their, that whole big, you know, kind of spider webby thing. I feel that. That big, that, their whole nature being such, like people come and go all the time. It's not about the, the, the units, it's about the machine, right? So, you know, a lot of work that has come through athletics has been, we did some work with X company. Those people, uh, they made that sound as they trickled out to other jobs. And then those, uh, you know, they were there and they said, well, we need a new website. Well, I worked these guys athletics a while ago. That had that great experience. Right? Yeah, and they were like super professional, on t like ahead of schedule, like worked great, and so on and so forth. So I mean, like a lot of it is, if you, like getting the first one, there's some luck involved. Uh, you just kind of gotta keep grinding, to be honest. But once you kind of get into that world to a certain degree, it kind of can uh, keep itself going, if that makes sense. And also, you know, we have like uh, we have some really perennial. We have some clients that like will like take a bullet for us. I'll be like, 
they're like, you will forever be a letter of recommendation. Like, if you need something, like, let me know. I will, like, you know, you know, promote your good graces. Like, you know, so like we have a couple clients that just will go to bat for us too. It's great. Yeah. And it sounds like what you're saying at the same time, though, is you've also got to be aware of who else is out there in your field who can help you when you need to outsource that. Sure. You need to sure. know that they're good as well to keep your reputation. Right. Going. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Because you can't do it all. But the people like internally, we have enough people that are awesome. And if we can't, if we go, if we had some of them were a little thorny, it's like, well, either don't commit to it or find the resources to do it that you believe in. You know, and like, it's not hard to find. There's not like, it's hard to find really, really good people. But at the same time, it's like, I think in what we do, like, we just want to be good at what we're doing. So if it's something we're not good at, we probably wouldn't do it. Right, but we're, we're saying we're only two people. You got to make it look like it's five. And then if you realize, you know what, I really do need person number five. You need to have somebody else in your field who's willing to work with right. you, sure. you can't, and and subtitle their name just to get on your bandwagon right. for you, future business. You so it's like networking. Sure, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you know, there, there are a lot of studios that we uh, we know we're on good terms with. Uh, you know, there's one right across the street that uh, I guess we haven't done anything with them for a while, but yeah, it's, it's the contacts are there. You know, we, we grab lunch, we keep in touch, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, uh, yeah, it's maybe not so much about knowing the competition, but more about knowing people that can be there for you, and vice versa. You know, like how many jobs have we gotten where it's somebody that got either in on over their head, or like they got started on something and realized the scope grew, and then you know they need a little help. Yeah. So definitely, totally the network. Oh, well, I know you guys are right now um, ten people. It's like. Um, that's right, you guys are Eight to ten more Eight to ten. Oh, okay. But you started it by yourself, but you really think that the team, the whole team thing, it's, it's, you can't do everything by yourself. Would it be smarter, would it have been smarter to start your startup with a team, or would it have been smarter the way you did it um, by yourself with a partner? Well, everybody's got to eat, you know? And it's like, none of, unfor unfortunately, none of us are like born into exorbitant wealth, so it's like, you have to kind of start small just out of the economics of it. Like, I can tell you this, like, a full, like, I can't, I don't remember the specific numbers, but like three full-time employees with health benefits that are actually getting paid a living wage is a lot of money. And having a lot, enough jobs to sustain those people is very challenging. So for us, it's like, that's a big thing. It's like creating a network that's like, I might do, you know, I might do five giant projects, 10 or 15 medium projects, and then like 30 small projects in a year. And that cumulative economic effect justifies my salary, you know what I mean? So it's like, you gotta put some irons in the fire. Like, you know, that's where it goes back from a project versus the organism. Bigger companies create an organism, and that organism has a process where no one is, everyone's replaceable, but that process and that organism like justifies the cash flow. That's just a different model. So athletics too, uh, really quickly, started out as the people individually, and they were just kind of like-minded and wanted to be in the same room. And then it started out, I think the, set, the individual aspect was stronger, but I think over time the collective aspect got kind of stronger. So in that sense, it, it, the, you know, the model is very non-traditional. So it's like, it was so organic that kind of like, almost thinking about it as should we have started with more people was kind of like. We're just it, starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like everybody did we specifically exactly what they were plan. best at, and then more people kind of like joined the fold. Yeah. I think plan it, but don't over plan it. Mm -hmm. Because that's the thing, it's like, we do app development and some people like, you know, talk to people and it's like, people come up with app, it's like, your app is too feature rich. It's like, well, yeah, because you try to think about what it could be 10 years from now and try to do all of that now. It's like, don't do that. Like, do what you're good at, build it, make it strong, and then like, build a new thing, make that strong, build upon your strengths. Don't try to get overly ambitious and do everything you want. You know what I mean? I think, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so you guys are a really small team, so I wonder, is there, was there ever a situation where you guys just had too many projects and another client that you worked with for, or for a while and you guys just had to say no? Like, we just can't give you the time or the intimacy on the project. Yeah, work. I mean, it's not so much workload as much yeah. as it is fit. <laughs> like, I don't, like, we're not, like, I don't, I, when we get, like, it's like getting, uh, like, eating at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's like, when I start to feel full, like, I'll be like, I don't want to eat anymore. Right. Versus like, we must take everything. Oh shit, we're screwed. Yeah, like, yeah. Don't do that. That's not going to work. You know, the things come in kind of progressively. So you can start feeling the sort of frequency of the studio and be like, okay, we're all busy now. Like, we probably, and like these guys that are doing this are like, cannot do anymore. Yeah. So like, there's no reason me to go pound the pavement to get another one of those right now. So does the client understand that? Like, do well, they you're know? You're contractually obligated to do the work for them. So like, 
they're, they, you have a contract that says you're going to do this work. No, but what I'm saying, right. if they go to you saying like, hey, can you do a variety yeah. page for us? I mean, from time to time, you know, we do have to pass on something. Right. I mean, that's just, yeah. you know, if you're working on things. Well, like, people, sure, people understand that. I mean, like, uh, yeah. you know, uh, you okay. know. Yeah, I committed to like a motion graphics job and like, we totally could have done it, but it was like, it was, it was the way they, the, the client was very high maintenance, wanted to be really like over your shoulder and like mm -hmm. wanted to like basically you be the extension of them. And it's like, there's no trust there. Like they had some crackpot ideas and it's like, yeah, we could do this, but like it would totally suck. So did you sever that relationship? Yes. I said, hey, I've organized all your stuff for you. And now that we know what it really can, entails, you need to just somebody local. Like we're in New York, you're not in New York. Like the back and forth is gonna be confusing and time consuming and inefficient. And vis-a-vis, -vis, what I really want to say is, you guys yeah. are high maintenance and super annoying, and you need to find a junior designer that you can feed to death and kill them in the next two weeks, <laughs> and that is not me. Right, right. Right? But like, in a very polite way, you mm -hmm. said, like, here's what you need to be doing, and this is the best way to do it. Yeah, and, and we'll I'm, not, and we'll I'm not going to take your money because I don't think that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. will, the, will that party call us in the future, contact us in the future for other jobs? Definitely. Yeah. Because, I mean, it left, we, we took the time and took the pains to make sure that we kind of like, we did sever the tie, but we did so in a way that it was like, everybody felt like this is the best choice for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the finished product was good. And it's like, it's yeah. some, some dude did it and like, it was great. And I was like, yeah, it's like, good. Like, mm -hmm. great, it turned out well. Like, I'm totally stoked for them. But it's like, we could have done it, but it would have been much more difficult. Right. Yeah. Um, you, so you talked about like managing teams and, and stuff like that. So do you, have you ever had any problems like managing a team of like designers? And the team team of developers, or like how they kind of like how they work together. Yeah, interact with each other. What do you think? Really that is really difficult, but other than that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it can be difficult. I mean, I think as long as as long as what the what the designers are doing is informed by the developers' needs, you're fine. That's why you do wireframes and UI and UX. You don't be like, oh, this is our awesome design that I didn't tell you about. You have to go build it. Like, it's done. Like, today, you'd be like, what? Yeah, so it's not, like, it's not some separate teams thing where you toil over it for a week and then show them, and they're like, well, this isn't actually even at all what it's supposed to be. You know, it's like we're in contact all the time. So, you know, problems typically get addressed before they become large enough that it is, you know, a problem, so to speak. Right. And so, like, designers, I mean, especially on the website, it's like the designer's work is completely informed by all of this development thinking beforehand. Okay. So. Yeah. That's the key. I mean, you can't do it any other way. I mean, back in the Cavalier days, like you could maybe be a designer developer, kind of like one man show, which I definitely came from. But it's like it's just in inefficient now. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is like the essential business skill or skills, if there are any, that like encourages the tipping point for where you like clients begin to start looking for you? Three, it's sort of three, three or four things combined. You have to have good work. You have to be able to speak about the work well and convince people that like you know what you're talking about. You have to be able to write about it, and then you have to be able to articulate it in business terms to justify a dollar figure. And how do you get them to listen to you when you do speak? What? How do you how do you get them to listen to you when you do speak? I mean, if you're courteous, first of all, that's really important. You know, you, you gotta gotta know what the rules are. You know, it's, it's like a dinner party. It's like yeah, like go to go to like go to your next like house party and like go talk to a complete stranger. And like, the better you are at that, the better you all be at business. It's like... Yeah, if you can articulate that you have a good understanding of the work, and if you can present it in such a way that it's like, we've arrived at the solution because this is what's best for the project. This is what the project's calling for. Um, you know, they're not always gonna say, that, oh yeah, you're totally right. But, you know, if you go into it with, uh, you know, the right kind of courtesy, you know, keep it from being a personal thing, realize it's the work, it's not you. That's a big one, I think, especially when you're young. Uh, yeah. but, um, but being excited about it and being articulate about yeah. it. It's like it's like if you and I if you and I wanted to talk records, you have to under, like and we have the same music, it's like you need to be able to speak my language. It's like, oh I love that band, yeah, I went to Mastodon, blah blah blah. It's like that's the same thing. It's like, oh I love web development, blah blah blah. Like we are in the same world. It's like it's got that kind of like synergy, you know, it's like it's the dinner party. It's like you have to come like we just had a big meeting yesterday with you people that could potentially be a huge client, and it's like you have to say that I know you, you know me, and there's this meeting point that makes that could be a cool professional relationship. So that's like, that that whole dance is like, it's not something that I can necessarily quantify. And like, I work for people that aren't good at that, and that are great designers. And that's fine, that's just a personality thing. I know people that could like, I know people that are like, 
awesome at talking to people. Like my buddy Greg is like, hey podium dude, what's up man? I love podiums, blah blah blah. It's like it doesn't matter what it is. But like is he a great designer? Like eh, it doesn't really matter because like his skill is engaging on that in that person to person way. So you just put him in a position to do the best thing he can. Think of it as like a band. It's like the bassist might might not be the most the bassist might actually be the band manager. Well usually it's the drummer. But but the guitarist might be like, I just want to play my riffs. You know what I mean? So it's like the different players. It might be something that's really good, but you just have to facilitate everybody's strengths. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have one more minute. Um, what I wanted to know is when we speak of planning, when we started, or during the course of the course, did you write a business plan? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I would well, we've kind of retro written one. Okay. I mean, I would, I would consider it, like definitely, like for at least Jot something on paper that gives you kind of a roadmap. So you haven't written one from the time you started until We had to be like, I'm starting now, I'm going to try to business plan before I start anyway. It's like, I would, this is me and this is just the way I run my life. It's like, the more you think about it before you do it, the more you keep thinking about it and not do it. It's like, go do it and then keep thinking about it while you're doing it. Yeah, like it's, it's good to plan to a certain degree, but also, I mean, Creative work is a dialogue, like, if it's going to be any good, like, with your life, with your client, with everything. Creative work changes so fast. So yeah. you can write you a new and when you put the, the ink is drawing, like, that whole thing you just thought of could be changing yeah. before it arrives. So it's like, yeah, I mean, have, have a plan or an idea, but, uh, you know, how formal you make it just depends on how, you know, how much you, how much security feeling you derive from having it on a piece of paper, because it's going to evolve and change, and being open to that is almost one of the best things you can do, really. Like yeah. when things come up and it's the right move, take it. Yeah, yeah. Don't make it up as you go along. Catalog your mistakes and be very like. Your job is to like learn from your mistakes and catalog that and like, you know, putting those things in the paper and like having a record of what you're doing and understanding why. It's important. You know, it's important. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, John. Thank you.